because I don't know how you – I'd rather do it there. Okay, brother. Okay, we are rolling? It will be. I think it minimizes that stuff, but you won't need it, so. Okay, yep, or click, the clickers were ready. You good? All right. All right, good morning. Bear with us, this isn't something that we do every week, and this is certainly something I don't do every week, but since our pastors both like to take vacations and crisscross each other, I got kind of a moment here. So here we are. It's called we're getting you in training. Yeah, yeah, thanks. This morning we're going to be talking about the doctrine of justification. I just want to point this out that this is this is pastor's material. He asked me to to teach today, and he present he gave me the material to present. So he didn't leave me out to dry and do this all on my own. He coached me along with this. So we're going to be studying today the doctrine of doc the doctrine of justification. If you want, you can write these scriptures down. We're going to go over most of them here. Um, but what we're doing, what this is, is just a brief introduction of one of the most magnificent doctrines in the Bible. This is the doctrine of justification. Everybody get their scriptures wrote down? We're already behind time, right faster. I'm sorry, yeah, I... Well, there's a story behind this. When I pulled up the PowerPoint, I pulled up my PowerPoint and I'm looking at it and I'm seeing all these different things. So you're going to be, you're going to get a lot of different slides on here that uh, may not make a lot of sense, but they look good. <laughs> all right. It's Romans 3, 24 to 28, Romans 5, 1, Romans 8, 33, Galatians 2, 16. Titus 3, 7, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Most of, most of these you'll see again in the, the later slides. So, yeah. Oh, I see. It's smaller up there. Well, you know, this was an, this was an experiment. So we're going to go with the definition. What is, what the, the word, what does the word justify mean? The definition, the word justify or justified are from the Greek. I have a hard time with the English language. So I'm not going to try the Greek. But you see the word up there. I the, yeah. But what it means is to be legally declared right with God. That is to be declared righteous before the Supreme Court of Heaven and God by God the Father. Justification speaks to the issue of God's justice. Okay. Slides get better. See there? Here's the greatest question of all time. If you want, you can turn your Bibles to Job chapter 9. Job chapter 9. going to be looking at the latter part of verse 2. Again, this is the, one of the greatest questions of all times. Job 9, 2. Uh, read the whole thing. He says, truly I know it is so. This is the question. But how can man, how can a man be righteous before God? So in a... Okay. In other words, how can God, a holy and righteous judge, accept sinners into his presence? Second, how can, a, how can he clear the guilty, forgiving their sins, and still remain just? How can God, as judge, impose the penalty that the offense requires, and at the same time let the guilty one go free? These issues are all dealt with by the Bible doctrine of justification. Number one, the source of justification is God the Father. Romans 8.33. Again, a lot of, most of these scriptures are up on the screen. If you just want to jot them down. 
Or you can turn there, it's all however you. Romans 8.33 reads this way, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. God is the one who justifies. Justify and righteous are directly linked. Number two, the grounds of justification. The grounds of justification, the blood of Christ speaks of his spiritual substitutionary death for all mankind. The blood does not refer to the literal blood itself as being the grounds of justification, but rather the blood speaks of his death. Who can tell me the two deaths that Jesus suffered on the cross? Spiritual and physical. Spiritual death. This was a full payment for sin as he was separated from God the Father from noon till three. During that time, God the Father took all the sins, all of our sins, 2,000 years before we were even thought of, he took our sins and he put them on his son Jesus. All the sins, past, present, and future. 2 Corinthians 5.21 Again, it's up on the screen. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That means Jesus sinned. No? Well, Paul, Paul, Paul just said it there, didn't he? Okay, he doesn't say that Christ was made. He said that Christ was made a sinner took our sins. He wasn't made a sinner. Christ bore our sins on the cross. He had no sins of his own. He said, that's just so we could be righteous in God's eyes. I like how West Side's always paying attention on a hot day. Can't get nothing past. Right? Turn over to Isaiah 53. I should have had a mark for that. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, 11 and 12. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many, and inter and made intercession for the transgressors. That's an awesome verse. His humanity was separated from God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. It was his sus substitutionary spiritual death and judgment that was the efficacious that was efficacious for our salvation. And that's what uh, a part of what Reba read this morning in Romans 8 3. Oh, you didn't read 8 3. That's right. I was thinking 3 8, but that's. <laughs> Romans 8 3 reads, For what the law could not do, that it was weak through the flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned the sin in the flesh. The second one, Scott yelled out back there, was physical death. Jesus Christ remained physically alive until after his salvation work was finished. But once his mission was accomplished by an act of his own volition, his own will, he did it all on his own. His soul and his human spirit left his body, and only then did he physically die. You can read that in Luke 23, 46. Luke 23, verse 46 reads, And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Our Lord's physical death, therefore, was a result of his spiritual death, but indicated, but indicated instead that his work the Father had given him to do 
plus complete. Christ laid the foundation for our physical resurrection, which in turn guarantees the believers. He laid the foundation for his physical resurrection, which in turn uh, guarantees our physical resurrection. On what grounds or what is the basis for God being able to declare the sinner righteous? Romans 3.24, that's one reason. Romans 3.24, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood. That is the NASB uh, reading of that one. Romans 3.24. Romans 3.24 in the New King James is being justified freely. Being justified as a gift. It is on the basis of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, which is a metaphor for his literal substitute, spiritual substitutionary death. It is on his cross death while bearing our sins that God the Father finds grounds for justifying the sinner. <laughs> and I lost my place up here but anyway Christ's death meets the demands of God's righteousness and thus frees God to justify those who believe in him I know where I'm at Romans 3 25 to 26 you can turn there or it's up on the screen also. Romans 3, 25 and 26. Whom God displayed publicly as propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, as I say, I say of his righteousness at the present time. So that he would just be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. I'll read that again in, in 25. <laughs> the King James just is just a small variance of words. Whom, whom set God forth as a propiti propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at that, at that time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In the accomplishments of death, of the death of Christ, that forms the sole ground of which God can extend the gift of eternal life, along with the full and complete forgiveness to any person who will simply believe in Jesus for his promise of unconditional eternal life. That is phase one salvation. Point number three. Point number three, the instrument of justification is faith. You see that in Romans 3.28. It reads, a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. To have faith and to believe are synonymous terms. I am sweating buckets up here. I feel sorry for you, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> to have faith and to believe are synonymous terms. Believe and faith, as the Greek shows, are just the verb and the noun for a concept that really, uh, they're really no different in English than in Greek. The concept is taking people at their word, trusting that what they say is true. The focus of faith to receive the free gift of eternal life is the promise of Jesus. We rest in that for our personal assurance of eternal life. Again, this is talking about phase one. Romans, the book of Romans was written to believers. Was written, it was written to help believers understand what happened to make the gift of life possible. It also guides us to have the right understanding of the cross work of Jesus Christ. It helps us to view the cross as God the Father views the cross. If you don't have the book, 
St. Hotus, the Book of Romans from the Grace Evangelical Society. If you don't have it, get it. It's worth the read. It helps you through the Book of Romans. He views it as complete and adequate solution to the problem of man's sin, and we need to view it likewise. When we do, then we view also the death of Christ is adequate to solve the great sin problem of mankind. Christ solved the sin problem of the Old Testament saints and he and all the way up to us right now. This is in harmony with the fact that salvation is by grace, nothing else. Amen. Phase one salvation is faith alone in Christ alone. You click at Romans 3.26. It all focuses on faith as the instrument. That's what we're talking about here is the instrument. Romans 3.26, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Also over in 5.1, in the same book, of, in the same, uh, book Romans, Romans 5.1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. At the moment we believe, we probably did not know of the many of the many grace gifts that came to us at that moment. When you put your faith alone in Christ, how many of you knew you got grace gifts? How many of you knew how many grace gifts? One of these gifts is the great truth of justification. Number four, the principle of justification is free grace. Again, we're looking at Romans 3.24. From the NASB, it says, we are justified as a gift by his grace. The word gift helps us to understand by his grace. In the New King James, you see it up there, justified freely. It emphasizes that it is free without payment. We can do nothing to earn it except believe. We do not merit justification. And we cannot merit, and we do not merit justification, and we cannot merit justification. It is a gift given freely. It is by grace through faith, as we see in Ephesians 2 8 and 9. We're all familiar with that verse. Number five, we're going to look at is the agent of justification, and that is the Holy Spirit. Look over 1 Corinthians 6 11. First Corinthians 6, 11, I'm reading from the New King James. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Quick summarize. It was the, it was God, it is God the Father who initiates justification. It is God the Son who executes justification, and it is God the Holy Spirit who applies justification. And I got good news for you. You're going to be done a little bit early today. Number six is the position of justification. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 you're in 1 Corinthians, turn to the right to 2 Corinthians 5.21, where it's up there on the board. 2 Corinthians 5.21 reads, For he who made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Those last two words, in him, shows us the position that we gain in justification. Finally, due to our union with Christ, his righteousness is imputed to us, credited to us, justification then comes as a result of God the Father crediting or imputing to the believer the perfect righteousness of God the Son. And that in the exact moment they believe in Jesus in his Son, Jesus Christ, for his promise of eternal life. The second you put your faith alone in Christ alone, you have that 
justification and and that's all I got. Thanks. I bet it's fun. I know. <laughs> You'll have about. <laughs> Hold on one second. You're not getting away that. You're not getting away that easy. We got a pastor here. No, it's done. So.